Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the wondrous Stella Duffy. We're talking about the PhD and embodiment and how you are so much more than just your brain um, and how in the PhD that might be a real challenge, that embodied experience and might be a real challenge, particularly if you are struggling with your physical health. Stella has an amazing way with words, um, and I do hope that you really enjoy this episode. Hello, Stella. Hi, Emma. This is such a treat for me. I, I love doing this podcast because I meet such awesome people and you indeed are a wonder. And I'm so excited to talk to you. And I would totally recommend that everybody stalk you online because you're amazing. <laughs> um, so oh, that's very gonna... kind of you, but I'm really grateful to you for having me because I think the podcast is super valuable. And I think you're doing a really, you're creating a very generous space. So thank you. Bless you. Thank you for that. I think that life rafters are very special people. Mm. It's a gorgeous community. And I'm, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of it. I think it's, um, we, you know, we're, hopefully we're going to shift academic culture and I'm, I'm excited about that. We um, can, but try. <laughs> definitely. We are, we are in it. We are, we are doing it. Um, so I'm I, also, I'm very grateful for you for that we're, what we're going to talk about today in terms mm. of, the PhD and physical health um, yeah. uh, because this is so important and uh, academic well, I've just saying before we got on that you know academic culture is it, it just you're encouraged to think of yourself as a brain on a stick and um, yes. it, it this is this is not true and not healthy and all of that and I'm I'm so mm. I'm so <laughs> pleased that we're going to get an opportunity to sort of unpick that um, brilliant but before we do that, I'm going to yeah. ask the question that I ask everybody to begin with to just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and mm -hmm. your journey into the PhD. OK, so um, I'm Stella Duffy. I'm a psychotherapist, a novelist, a short story writer, a theatre writer. I have been a theatre director, though there's no time for that anymore. Um, I'm a facilitator and a creative mentor and a wife of 33 almost years to my brilliant wife. Um, I, uh, how did I get here? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a working class kid from a South East London council estate and I'm the youngest of seven. The youngest of seven is really important because my siblings are bright, smart, brilliant people, but they didn't get to stay at secondary school long enough to go to university, let alone go to university. So I'm not just the first in my family to go to university, which I am. Mm. including my extended family and cousins. I'm the first in my family to finish secondary school. And what I know from that is that I'm not so special. Um, I know that I'm fortunate purely by accident of birth. Mm. And what that gives me at a week off 60 <laughs> is a great deal of gratitude for the opportunities I've had, which is not to say that my siblings haven't had or are having amazing lives. They absolutely have. They just haven't had the academic opportunities that I had. And that said, when I did go to university at 18, I, I was born in London. We moved back to my father's native New Zealand uh, when I was five years old. He'd come over during the war good old baby socialist, met my mum, had seven kids. Um, <laughs> and uh, we went back when I was five. And I, I had the great good fortune of growing up in a town that was largely Maori, Polynesian, Samoan, Niue and Tongan. I had a great good fortune of growing up in a place where I was a white minority, albeit a colonising minority, a white minority. I, I, I grew up where lots of cultures existed side by side and really happily long before we use the term multicultural, at least not in my little town. But education wasn't a, it just wasn't usual or normal, you know, for, for kids mm. to go off to university. Um, and so when I did go to university, I, I went to university to do drama. And you couldn't mm. even do a drama degree then. I just had to go where you could do drama in your second year and a bit more drama in your third. I couldn't do a degree in it. Um, I, I, 
I know this is going to sound weird, particularly to people who are from an academic background, but I didn't know what a master's was. Right. Yes. And so when I left university at the end of my third year with a very, very rubbish BA, because I'd spent the whole time doing plays and, you know, part of the drama club, we didn't call ourselves a drama society. We thought that sounded too posh. And even then in 1981, we were trying to be more inclusive. Um, But when I left, a friend of mine from a more middle class family was, was staying on to do an MA in creative writing. And honestly, I can't tell you this it didn't occur to me it was a possibility. You know, I left home at, at 17. I turned 18 in my first year at university. What I understood I was there to do was to maybe get some learning so I could then get a job and do some other stuff with my life that neither of my parents who had to leave school at 14 or my siblings who left school at 15 and 16 had ever had the opportunity to do. I didn't I didn't know what further, further education was. Mm, mm, mm. And I don't think I was unusual. No. And I think that there is a lot of people who get to where I am now and go, oh, looking back, it, it's not that it's not that people said, no, you can't because you're a working class kid. It's just that no one ever told us we could. Yeah. So how, yeah. oh, God, that makes me want to cry, actually. Yeah, yeah. How could we ever have known? Yeah. So here I am now, hopefully completing my doctorate this year, and I'm doing a, a, a self-funded a doctorate in existential psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. And I've come to that out of my second cancer. I had my first breast cancer when I was 36. Chemotherapy made me both menopausal and infertile at 36, just at the point we were trying to have children. And then hoping that the trade-off of chemo and radio and surgery was going to keep me alive and did for a while. I kept on with my writing work, with my Communities work with an organisation I co-founded called Fun Palaces that supports creative, creativity in communities, but led by people in communities, not led by some nice posh middle class person flying in and telling them what creativity really is. Um, <laughs> and uh, but then I had my second cancer at fifty, and I was running this organisation, Fun Palaces, at the time, and I threw myself into the work. And about two years in. I I really needed some more help. And I had had some psychotherapeutic help on my first cancer. I had to pay for it that wasn't available 23 years ago on the NHS as as, as readily as it is now. Mm. Not not for anybody, but with cancer. Mm. Um, but I went and asked and they said, yeah, you, you know, we can offer you eight sessions. <laughs> and the eight sessions were just by chance with an existential psychotherapist. And I... I can't tell you, Emma, I honestly, I'm sitting here talking to you on my computer and I'm waving a hand, uh, my left hand, because my work is so embodied. I'm waving my mm. left hand in the air mm. to say, in that work around existential psychotherapy, using existential philosophy to open up space around our choices, our responsibilities, what choices and responsibility we take for our past as well as for our future, I honestly felt like, like a wall opened and when I describe it to people, I say it's, it's always on my left-hand side, almost always, and it's like suddenly there was a lake and some mountains and some trees and this whole world I didn't know existed. And my therapist, who ended up becoming my regular therapist, but after a, a fairly substantial break, because that's the protocol, mm. um, had trained in existential psychotherapy, and, and so I, I looked into it. And I was, you know, I was running a UK-wide organisation, only paid two days a week, though, because we're working with communities, so there's no money for working with communities, mm. writing the novels I could. And I'm a literary novelist, not a bestseller, so it wasn't like I was getting paid hundreds of thousands of pounds by any means. Um, and and I was, oh, well, you know what, I'm actually going to say this out loud because I think academic people think that everyone else gets paid loads for writing. Hmm. Um, it is really common for a literary novelist in Britain to earn eight or nine thousand pounds for a book that takes us four years to write. Really common, if not less. And I don't think academic writers know this. And no. I really think people should know, you know, the average writer in Britain, according to the Writers Guild, earns only about nine grand. And bear in mind, they're probably including J.K. Rowling's fortune. <laughs> anyway, right, right, right. No, long-winded way of saying yeah. I wanted to come into existential therapy and training. And I started the doctorate thinking, oh, I can, because the way this one is taught is taught in modules. And I was like, okay, well, I could just do a PG dip. I can manage that. I I know I can do that. I know I can achieve that. 
And then when that was going all right, I was like, okay, while also working, while also, you know, because it's all part time. I was thinking, okay, well, well, I could do the master's level. And the way they make it is like, you know, oh, come on, once you've done that, don't be sure. (laughs) <laughs> it's a gateway drug. <laughs> it's it's a gate- oh, oh, you know what? I had no idea. I mean, God forbid there was a bit of me going, yeah, but there's that other idea. Maybe I could do another doctorate and that. Seriously, I had no idea. I didn't know. I had never heard the term literature review. I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. I hadn't I hadn't done any of this kind of work. But fortunately, my training is there's a lot of theory, but there's also a lot of practice. Mm. You have to do mm. 450 practical hours, and I got the great fortune of working at a hospice and working in a cancer um, psycho-oncology support unit, working with people with cancer, giving back what I'd had the great benefit of. And I, it's not that I don't still want to tell stories, but I now feel that my work is in supporting other people to tell their stories. And so that's what therapy is from a, from a psychotherapeutic point of view for me, is supporting people to tell the stories they want to tell about their own lives. And my research is in the embodied experience of postmenopause. And it's that because, well, for a start, I've been postmenopausal since I was 37 and I'm nearly 60. I mean, really nearly next week. Um, but it, yeah, it's really cool. It's so cool when it, when you've been as ill as I am. There's nothing wrong with getting old. It's no. just glorious. No. Um, no. And and the other reason it's that is because I kind of wanted to do a doctorate about creativity and cancer, but I knew that that would be too close to the bone, right. literally the bone. Right. And then I wanted to do something about infertility and and creativity. And that felt too close to the bone. But, of course, the minute you start talking about menopause with people, a whole lot of stuff about embodied experience comes up anyway. A whole lot of stuff mm. about symptomology comes up anyway. But because I've chosen to do post-menopause, and, and you know, we know how long these things can take, mm. four years ago when I decided this might be it, Davina wasn't on telly telling us that menopause is the end of our life. You know, um, menopause hadn't become this big story or it certainly wasn't so much in the public eye. So I thought I was doing something quite unusual and then suddenly I'm doing a really hot topic. But the excitement I have about mine is that I'm interested in post-menopause. You know, the, the next third of our lives, menopause is not the end. It's the opening of old age. It's the beginning of the last third of our lives. And that really excites me. So I've just had the most glorious time. I, I started the analysis of my my eighth 90-minute interview today, and the people I've spoken to have been so generous and so open and so sharing, and I'm learning so much from them, and I'm looking forward to being more into my 60s like the, like the people I've spoken to. So I'm thrilled with it all, but that's a long way of saying 17-year-old me who left high school in a small town in New Zealand. And it in my, so it was like a seventh form, which was like a upper sixth used to be. Mm. You didn't do a two-year sixth form in New Zealand. You did a seventh form. Our third form, which is when high school starts, had, I think, 300 or 400 kids in that third form. By our seventh form, there were only 16 of us because mm. that was how unusual it was to stay on long enough to go to university. Mm. So Mm. it wasn't just my family, it was the entire world I grew up in. Mm. So I could never have dreamed I'd be sitting to you now, (laughs) sitting talking to you now about my doctorate. (laughs) Honestly, that makes me want to cry too because it's similar to the first novel I wrote, you know, when I, and that someone wanted it. And that Mm. was nearly, that was nearly 30 years ago. I just couldn't believe that someone like me would have their name on the spine of a book. Because it wasn't in the story. Working class writers weren't in my childhood. My mum and dad didn't know agents. They didn't go to, you know, the sort of colleges where you know those things. It was all, it is all, it is all new. And I'm so grateful that I have this at this stage of my life. Oh, my goodness. I see, everyone, I told you she was wondering. <laughs> I told you this. Oh, blimey. Blimey, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling all the feels at the moment mm. this because mm. of this. Well, there's a lot in your story that I relate to, um, yeah. but, but also this sense of the passion and the mm. privilege mm. and the delight mm. um, in knowledge 
and in academia and in exploring and inquiring and the curiosity I just and I, I, I love that we we're starting there because because often we can forget that um, yes the challenges of of the PhD and actually the privilege mm. um mm. and the delight you know what would my nana say? If, well, if absolutely. You know, my, my nana was in service at the age of eleven. Oh, exactly. That's what, my what, family too. Yeah. How, how amazing would it have been for? And who would you and I be actually? Yeah. Although I hasten to add, I'm pretty happy with who I am now, and I hope you are too. <laughs> so it's not that I want to change my past, but I, yeah. I damn well want to make more access for more people, yeah. and I hope that I know that your work does make more things accessible. And I hope that my work is in this field, because I, I, I trust that my work in, in theatre and in creativity has has done some of that. But I hope that my work in this field does too, because I, you know, and, and to go to go on to you know the embodied idea. Yes. Yes. The reason I wanted to look at the embodied experience of postmenopause, and by embodied I don't mean symptomology, because unfortunately menopause has now just become equated with symptoms, but it's a transition. Mm. And mm. any time we experience, you know, as as a not mother, becoming infertile from chemotherapy, going through IVF in the hope it might work, and then losing five embryos one after the other inside of me, they too were embodied experiences, just as motherhood is an embodied experience. And I would suggest that I think it probably is also for someone who adopts. I don't know, mm. I haven't. But I have a sense that if you're an adoptive parent, there's still an embodied experience going on mm. because your your body needs to change in order to well to learn how to hold and love another human being, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I very much see saw my own menopause, and because it coincided with cancers, and because I now live with chronic pain from quite advanced osteoarthritis due to having been very ill a lot, and probably being older, physically older before my time. Yes. Um, yes. Not to say lots of us aren't, of course, but but I think that's probably, and my you know doctors think that's probably what's happened with my body. Right. I'm really aware that I also have the privilege of education and, and academia, academic access in a body that is, well, it's a health condition at the moment, and, and I don't know what, what support I can get, and I do have a couple of consultations coming up. But if things go on this way, I will probably start beginning to be a bit braver about using the word disability about nice. how I feel nice. um and the reason I'm I'm less brave about it is I I have some friends who've lived with disabilities all of their lives they're disability activists and I I don't want to be jumping in on their territory right. Right. unless unless I feel like I, I can't not I it's really important to me to to give that the space it deserves um but but my embodied experience of of studying online as well yes, yes, um, yes has been an awful lot of sitting down when sitting down is painful yes it has been an awful lot of screen time when my eyes get very tired and I don't know that we're acknowledging that enough as well and so yes. for me to to be researching what it's like to be in and of the body yes. and the embodied experiences is how we be in the world in our body how is it for me to walk down the street as me now that I limp now that I'm very slow now that sometimes people see me coming get out the way and sometimes they don't um <laughs> how is it for me to live like this how was it when I was having 40 hot flushes an hour when I first went into early menopause how was it to walk down the street then you know mm. what is it like to be carrying a body that is changing shape involuntarily as we often do in post-menopause and then the thrilling thing has been hearing from the the, the participants who are a, a few years older than me how thrilling it has been to be fully post-menopausal and how much more back in their bodies they feel like way more in their bodies than, and several of them have said, even though they have missed their cycles, they have missed, despite a couple who had terribly painful periods, brutally painful periods, yes. endometriosis, all sorts of difficult things, but they have still been able to say, I missed the cycle for the emotional content. Right. And right. yet they feel they are thriving postmenopausally. And I'm not sure that story's got out there enough yet. And I'm I'm hoping that that my research, which will, you know, be a drop in the ocean. But because I've chosen to talk to people who are postmenopausal, I'm not for a moment suggesting it's like this for everybody, because of course we live in such an ageist culture. But I think there might be a tiny sweet spot <laughs> mm. where we might just get to the 
fully postmenopausal part where our, our symptomology is under whatever control we get for it, whether it's diet or exercise or hormone replacement, if that's available to you and appropriate for your body, which it isn't for all of us, or whatever way we make those accommodations. Or we just get through it by sheer, you know, dogged determination, which certainly some of my participants felt they wanted to. But out of that, and before ageing kicks in so painfully as it does in our culture, there does seem to be, from my participants, this sweet spot of, oh, this is me. This is the me I'm being becoming. This is the me I want to take into old age. This old woman me that I'm becoming. And I'm very, very excited by that. And and I would also say I don't have any trans or non-binary participants because there was an age range thing and a couple of trans people who offered were were younger than the age range. But talking to to transitioned friends and non-binary friends, they too are saying it just at this point, out the other side, I'm feeling more me than ever before. And for me, that's, even with the difficulties of my body, the, the lived body that I experience now, I, every second step is painful to me. I, I don't move without pain. But this, I'm more me. And me now includes a researcher. You know? Me, me okay. now, now includes a person who who is, you know, using my previous storytelling skills to find ways of sharing the stories of, of amazing other people. I love it. I love it. And I love this this theme of transition, which is kind of mm-hmm. running parallel, mm-hmm. isn't it? Because yes, we talk about a lot. The, the, the PhD is a transition. Okay. You literally become a different person. You become a doctor at the end. You become a different yes. person uh-huh. at the end. Um, and, but also alongside that as you're recognizing particularly in your work around menopause mm. but for, for many other people their physical body yeah is is in transition in yeah. this process so that then yeah. it may be menopause it may be chronic illness there'll be mm-hmm. other things that are going on for some people sadly acute illness as well yes. um so i wonder whether mm. you have some thoughts to share in terms of in terms of being with that experience yeah. Um, managing that experience um mm. because it, that's it's tough that's really tough to be doubly transitioning oh yeah, um, yeah. and all that the physical the, the whole the, the, the physical as you say pain and tiredness mm-hmm, and all mm-hmm, of that mm-hmm. so I think and this is I mean this has come up with working with people with cancer it's certainly come up with working with clients who are menopausal or menopause I quite like menopausy um but 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 also in post-menopause and post-cancer you know because we're still transitioning so I if I think myself after both cancers our culture wants to go hurrah you did it well done let's not worry about it anymore Mm. But but we have to learn to live with the fear of recurrence we have to learn to live with the this kind of abyss that opens up when we truly acknowledge our own mortality Mm. um speaking to friends who've given birth you know that 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 experience does sound very similar to an acknowledgement of one's own mortality and then of course it all gets swept away because you have a human being you have to care for so you can't keep thinking about or or, or often addressing what's going on for you Mm. um but of course it is a transition now pregnancy is usually a voluntary transition but not always menopause is an involuntary transition just like illnesses for I mean I I suppose some people yes actually that's not quite true some people have chosen menopause for example if they're if, if they if their periods are so brutal they will may perhaps choose a surgical or a medical menopause but it's pretty unusual mm-hmm. for most of us menopause is an involuntary transition in the same way that my cancers were involuntary transitions in the same way that my own menopause post chemotherapy was an involuntary transition And I think involuntary physical transition can be deeply difficult. And Mm. chronic illness, acute illness does this. Mm. Mm. Passing illnesses, the flu, COVID, you know, they they carry with them a fear of our mortality. Mm. And I think the only way we can work with that is by noticing that, um, here speaks an existential psychotherapist, Um, we (laughs) we are dying, we're all dying, we're all always dying, and therefore oh, this is a moment of life. Here I am maybe at an edge place because I'm feeling so unwell or so tired that I can feel what what life is like when it's slipping 
as well as when I'm grasping it and just letting our moments be what they are. And this is where, I mean, I'm also very fortunate to have had a Buddhist practice since 1986. Mm -hmm. And I call it a practice because goodness knows I'm not a brilliant Buddhist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it is a lifelong practice. Mm -hmm. But our, our Western in particular attachment to no pain, always joy, feeling great, being on top of things, and, and, you know, this this awful thing that second wave feminism gave us, so I'm so much happier with third and fourth wave feminism, but the, the second wave feminism gave us by insisting that we that we had it all and we did it all brilliantly, all of it. And right now, this idea that, you know, as we age, we've got to be these people who age fantastically well and we don't ever put on any weight and we don't and we don't mind if we do and we're fine about this and we're either glorious crones or we're you know we're, we might as well be 25 forever just letting us be who we are in the moment that we be that that is the only way I personally have ever found come to get through my stuff and it's always getting through it is exactly like going on a bear hunt there is no going over no going round, and no going under we live we live through it our aging our losses it's all just grief and you only get through grief by going through it and there is no out the other side because out the other side we'd have to be dead to stop loving the people we've lost we'd have to be dead to stop being in pain if it hurts we'd have to be dead to stop going oh wow I woke up another day another day older how cool and I don't want to be dead yet so I'll take what life offers that's so beautiful and and I really don't mean that people have to be okay about that and I know I can sometimes sound a bit Pollyanna and I suspect that is because of having been so unwell Mm. a couple Mm. of times I get as annoyed and upset and frustrated as as the next person, I promise. But I do also have, weirdly and in retrospect, the good fortune of having come through some tough things. Mm. And I I don't wish them on anybody, but my knowing of having come through those things and that I can get through tough things is also useful at the moment. Stella, thank you so much for this. I, I think that that your quality of reflection and the depth of reflection there are just encouraging us to well to have the existential perspective <laughs> on this, the, the bigger and, picture. And encouraging is exactly right because courage comes from mm. the, those of you who know French. The French word for for heart is cœur. So when we encourage people, we enhearten them. Mm. so we're asking ourselves just to come back to our heart that's all that's everything lovely thank you so and much and you're and you're you're not a you're not a brain on a stick you are a, De- you're a oh no person. i'm not i'm a full full oh, fully person. embodied human being you know we can't we can't write our theses from brains on sticks i teach yoga for writing you can't plug a wire into your brain and then it comes out in your thesis You've got to do it through your body. You've got to type or voice dictate through your breathing body. Um, this question always feels mm. awkward for me, but this feels okay. especially crass at the mm. end of this interview. This Fantastic. Is Bring it on. It's elegant, beautiful. Um, but I, I'm now going to ask. Bring me your out crassness. Of, out of <laughs> all of that, yeah. is there anything I will say top tip? I can't quite bring myself to say this. I just, a thought mm. to leave us with. That's mm. how I have to do it this time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I really, really do. If it is humanly possible for you, get your feet on the ground or your hand in water or your face in rain occasionally. I know that that's not possible for everyone because some people are bed bound and maybe that's not possible, but get someone to I know, bring you some dirt. Yeah. Seriously, if it is humanly possible, remind ourselves that we are off the earth and the sky and the sea. That'd be my top tip. Oh my goodness. Stella, thank you so, so much. Yeah, thank I, you, I, Emma. It's so much in there. <clears throat> and Happy birthday to you. I just <laughs> yeah. celebrate that we have got to share you on planet Earth for 60 years. How amazing is that? How cool. And I, you know, I'm so because of my research, I'm so like 60 is the beginning of my old. And oh, I am yeah. thrilled. It's the big be- I'm starting old now. It's oh, cool. 
I love it. I can't wait to see what comes next. Um, <laughs> Stella, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. 